Anyway, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I'm ready to talk a little bit about getting paid, uh, which I think is a, a good thing for, for all of us. Um, payments can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And really today I want to tackle kind of one use case, which is just how payments work in a marketplace. Um, there's a lot of other ways people use payments. There's recurring billing, there's sort of traditional e-commerce, the list kind of goes on. Um, so the kind of deal is I'm going to talk for 10 minutes about uh, marketplace payments and then we'd just love to have 10 minutes of Q&A. So I'll try to keep it nice and short. Um, and uh, we just have a good discussion uh, about getting paid. So uh, the way I'm going to kind of frame the talk today is around a sample marketplace. Uh, it's called Yapu, uh, WePay spelled backwards. Um, and the marketplace is a you know, fake marketplace that is a place for people to come and buy uh, 3D printed miniature goods. So you've got buyers that are coming to buy 3D printed miniature goods and a whole bunch of 3D printing people on the other side that are, are selling that. Um, and Yapu is a marketplace to, uh, to connect that. Um, so these guys started this business, you know, small startup. They started to get to about a million dollars a month in GMV, which is sort of a, a good milestone um, for a marketplace. Things are good. Um, how are they accepting payments? How does that work? How does the back end work? Um, well, the way almost 99% you know, of the marketplaces that I talk to start out um, is they use what's called the merchant of record model. Uh, and so the merchant record model means that the marketplace is sitting in the middle. Uh, the marketplace accepts credit cards. Uh, you know, they charge the buyers. They take all that money into a bank account. And then they figure out how to pay all these different sellers. Um, and it becomes sort of a little bit of an operational nightmare that we'll talk about. But it's the easiest way to get started. You sign up for a merchant account with, from Braintree or Stripe or Authorize.net or any kind of number of other uh, merchant account providers. You charge those cards. You stick that money in a bank account. And you can pay people out on the back end with ACH or PayPal or Western Union or checks um, or sort of a number of other ways. Now, let's talk a little bit about Things are going well, so merchant record. At the end, I kind of have a glossary, because I'm going to use some sort of payments jargon. Uh, and I'll have a link that you guys can download it if you want to uh, look at it later. So things are good. Um, the, uh, you know, the marketplace is, is cruising along. And then all of a sudden, these guys start to run into some problems. And so let's talk about the problems with the merchant of record model um, for a marketplace. Uh, the kind of first thing that usually people run into is they run into the card networks. So, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover have these like thousand page documents called the operating regulations um, that specify how you can accept credit card payments. And it specifies things like you know, what has to be on our receipts, you know, what types of things can, can get processed through the network, how things have to be coded. Um, and one kind of very important, important rule for marketplaces is this prohibition of what's called aggregation. Um, and so aggregation means you set up a merchant account, you're processing all these payments, but it's not really for you. It's for a bunch of other sellers on the back end. And the card networks really don't like that. Um, and the reason for that is that it doesn't give them visibility into what those transactions are for or what's going on. Right? You're signing up as a marketplace processing all these payments. But really, what if one of your sellers is a child pornographer or something terrible like that? Um, the card networks really want to have insight into who those sellers are on all these different platforms. And so they have this rule against aggregation. Um, for a while, usually things are good. People are set up, they're running. Um, and it's usually when they get to about a million or two in GMV a month that the scrutiny starts to, to raise and they run into uh, to problems. So that's sort of issue number one is kind of compliance with the card network rules. We'll get to some more fun problems in a, in a minute, I promise. Uh, and so number two is sort of about regulatory issues. Uh, and I think you know, some of you may have seen, you know, if you're sort of payment geeks like me, you may, you may have heard of this term called money transmission. Um, and so money transmission is a set of laws uh, that's sort of different in, in many different states. It's uh, a set of regulation that's been passed in about 37 states. Uh, and it's also been passed by the federal government. Uh, and so money transmission sort of very generally regulates the transmission of money for others. Uh, which, you know, in a marketplace context, it's kind of what you do, right? You're receiving money and, and paying someone else. Um, and so generally for a while, people are getting started. They don't really think about this. And then the sort of states start to see you, and, they, and then they send you letters. And so WePay's gotten five of these letters. Uh, and, you know, you get a nice letter from a state government sort of saying, hey, what are you doing over there? And uh, do you know about money transmission? And why aren't you re registered with us? Why don't you have a license? Uh, and so it's, it, it's, again, one of those issues that you can kind of start off, um, but then you start to run into issues with over time, something to be aware of. I'm going to try to get to the next slide. There we go. Um, OK, so, so sort of the rules aside, um, you know, card network rules, laws, um, sort of one of the critical issues with this model is, is that of fraud. Um, and so how does fraud work in a marketplace? 
Uh, so imagine you have John, who's a 3D printer on one side. Um, you've got Jane, who's a, a buyer of his 3D printed items on the other side. Um, and they're going to do this transaction through the marketplace. So Yapu charges Jane's credit card. Um, you know, say it's $100 for this 3D printed item. It charges Jane 100 bucks, takes that money into their bank account, um, and then pays out John, the 3D printer, uh, as a way to, you know, in exchange for him shipping you know, this item, this 3D printed item. Great. Life is good, right? They take their little fee and, and move on with their life. The problem, what happens, though, if John doesn't ship that item? Um, or what happens if John doesn't even exist? What if he's completely fraudulent? Uh, then what happens? Well, Jane can call her credit card company and initiate what's called a chargeback. Um, and what a chargeback is is a reversal of that transaction. So she paid the $100 to the marketplace. The marketplace paid, say, $90 to John. Um, but now Jane is reversing that initial $100 charge. So now the marketplace has paid out $90 over here and is paying back $100 over here, and they've just lost $90. Um, and so that's a really big problem in marketplaces. You know, $100 may not sound like a huge, you know, a huge loss, um, but you, know, you add this up over time, or if you give fraudsters the ability to manipulate your system, they can create thousands or tens of thousands of accounts and run lots of little transactions. It's another issue that WePay has run into. You know, we, there's, there's been weeks where we've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to fraud. Uh, and it's, it's a very real problem um, for these marketplace companies. So kind of that aside, you've got the operating rules. You've got compliance with, uh, with laws. You've got fraud. You know, I've got one more headache for you to deal with, uh, and that's kind of around operational burdens. So you're moving all this money. There's all this sort of stuff going on. Um, and there's other things you have to think about besides just moving money around. Sort of, there's you know there's 1099k tax filings, there's chargeback processing. You have to this bank account that's moving millions of dollars through it, and you got to reconcile it to the penny um, every day. These are kind of tough problems to wrestle with as a small company trying to build uh, a, a liquid marketplace. Um, and so I think just kind of things to think about in these four buckets are uh, you know regulatory, so the card network regulations, the you know laws that that govern payments, fraud and risk. Um, compliance with some of the other card network rules as well, like PCI and, and building the right anti-money laundering policies and know your customer policies. Um, and then lastly, the operations of payments, you know, processing disputes, reconciling that bank account, dealing with chargebacks, um, sort of big buckets to think about in the kind of marketplace context. And marketplaces are probably one of the more complicated um, payment problems that, that entrepreneurs have to solve, um, which is why I chose to, to focus on it today. So, what can marketplaces do? Um, you know, they've, there's all these headaches. You know, what, what can happen? Um, a lot of times, we see people turn to PayPal or another type of payment service provider like Amazon Payments. Um, that can actually help solve almost all of these problems right away. You know, they're no longer on the hook for fraud. They no longer have to comply with all of these rules because those, those platforms ensure that that happens. Um, but the impact to the user experience is usually pretty negative. You know, when you check out with PayPal, there's the kind of infamous redirect, and you know, there's incentives to pay with your bank account or pay with your PayPal account, and it's very disruptive to the marketplace experience. It's also similar experiences for the seller. They have to go sign up for this other service, you know, perform KYC, provide their social security number. Pretty disruptive to the user experience, but it saves you at least from all those, those headaches. So what we decided to build at, at WePay, and there are others out there that provide services like this that I'll talk about in a second, is we tried to give all the benefits of the merchant record solution, where you can deliver that amazing user experience, um, but still help you with all of the sort of headaches and, and stuff on the back end, the compliance, your risk and fraud, all that kind of stuff. So let me get through this. And so what's, like, what's sort of the framework to use as an entrepreneur if you're building a marketplace? Um, we talked about PayPal. Solves a lot of those issues um, for you, but doesn't give you the user experience that you want. Um, there's Stripe and Braintree and other merchant accounts, which give you absolutely the user experience you want. Um, but there's all this other sort of stuff to deal with on the back end. And then there's kind of this new emerging third category um, that are sort of payment companies that have special products for marketplaces. Um, there's us. Braintree has a product called Marketplace, Stripe has a product called Connect, and there's a company called Balanced. These guys, we all provide specialized payment systems for marketplaces that sort of give you this great cohesive user experience that you want, and yet help you with all the heavy lifting on the back end. And so I'd encourage you to check out that category. The differences between us, I think, are out of the scope of, of this talk, but I think it's important to understand, hey, I'm building this marketplace. You know, what things do I have to think about, and what are the trade-offs that, that I need to make? Um, so I've got 
sort of a glossary on our blog if you guys want to check it out uh, and it can help give you a guide to, to work through a lot of this. Um, but we'd actually just love to spend the last couple of minutes um, answering questions about, about anything. Yeah. Doing what kind of management? Sure. So uh, the question was best practices about having to go back to the customer and recharge the card. Is that yeah? Um, so I think most payment companies will tokenize the card uh, for you, uh, and so you can store it and keep it on file. Um, in the sort of e-commerce world, typically you're doing a real-time authorization, so you sort of know at the time of purchase if um, if the right card is being charged, if the funds are available, if it's valid. You run into that issue with having to go collect new payment information when you're, when you're in a re subscription or recurring business, yeah. Um, so there are some products uh, that will actually go and update the cards for you. There's a there's functionality called Account Updater that a number of the recurring guys offer, where actually they'll work through Visa and MasterCard to get the updated credentials. Um, so that's a, that's a good option that can help with some of the cards. Um, but in terms of having to actually go back to the customer and recollect that, there's a whole bunch of UI that, that can get built. And there's, there's companies that specialize in that. There's Recurly and Spreedly and another number of other companies that will basically give you a product to, to go recollect those credentials. That's what I'd recommend. Yeah? What about the location of the seller? Does that get you tax nexus and as a result cause the additional maybe expansion of the tax you need to collect? Yeah, so the question is, how does the location of the sellers affect tax nexus in a marketplace context? It's a great question. Um, there's kind of two ways to set up your marketplace. You can basically be totally sort of side party where you're just connecting people and allowing them to transact. In that case, most marketplaces argue that they don't have tax nexus and they're not, they're not sort of liable to pay out those sellers. They're just facilitating a connection. Um, the, the other sort of form, which is getting more popular with marketplaces like Uber and, and Lyft, is a more curated experience where the marketplace is kind of standing in there and saying, hey, we're, you know, we're basically providing this service, um, and we have these sellers on the other end. And it gets a lot more gray there. Um, and candidly, there's not really like clear guidance about what that means. And there's a lot of marketplaces trying to argue that no, that it, they shouldn't have to you know, file 1099s and be a tax nexus and all that. I think it's pretty undecided, though. It's kind of, marketplaces sort of break a lot of the traditional rules, because you've got a company that's really not taking responsibility for the products it's selling or the way it's being fulfilled. Um, and so it breaks a lot of the existing regulation. And so I think what you'll find is for the card network rules, for money transmission regulation, for the IRS, um, it's very gray. Uh, and so I think it's, it's you know, an area that you have to kind of tread lightly on. Sure, so the question was, uh, can we give an overview of the infrastructure um, of just how payments work? Uh, it's really complicated. We could talk for hours about that, but I think I can kind of give a, a super high level. Um, the, the sort of closest to the user is the merchant, right? That's the, uh, the, the person actually selling the goods or trying to accept the credit card. That could be a website. It could be a merchant person with a, with a terminal. Um, they're sort of accepting the card credentials. Kind of upstream from them, it's typically called the gateway or, or the processor. Um, and that's basically an API or a technology layer that's integrating into those terminals or integrating in that website to accept uh, credit card credentials. Then if you kind of go upstream one layer from them, um, payments is a business of middlemen, I'll tell you that. Uh, there's a, there's a, something usually called the acquirer. Uh, and the acquirer is typically a bank, um, but it could also be a sort of non-bank private company that works with that gateway, um, processes those cards, and ships them upstream into the Visa and MasterCard network. Um, you have to be a registered acquirer in order to sort of allow merchants to, uh, to accept credit cards. Um, so that's kind of the merchant side, how do you get to, to Visa. From the cardholder side, um, you know, so that credit card number got, kind of goes all the way upstream. Uh, you know, that the request gets authorized by the issuing bank of the card, um, and then that request kind of comes back downstream and says, yep, okay, pur purchase is a go. So that's sort of the authorization message. And then sort of you take a step back, the next day the money actually moves where 
you know, the issuing bank will basically pay the acquirer, the acquirer will pay the merchant for that sale, um, kind of minus the applicable fees. Yeah? Yeah, so what companies like WePay, it's Stripe, and Braintree, um, it's a little difficult to say because everyone has kind of different products. Like Braintree has a pure gateway product, which is just that layer. And then they also are an acquirer for other functions of their business. But for the most part, companies like Stripe and like us are basically, we sit in front of that whole stack. Um, we've got a contract with our own gateway, our own acquirer, all that kind of stuff. And we just basically shield the merchant from that whole process. Um, and so there's a premium for that, right? We're charging, you know, we charge a markup over the fees that we pay upstream, but we can all aggregate demand across a bunch of different merchants to get really low prices for us, and we build an easy user experience for everyone else. And so the, you know, the, the nice thing that is we give you guys an interface to basically work with the payment system um, without having to read the thousand page operating regulations and deal with all these sort of headaches. Um, we sort of give that to you on a, on a silver platter. How much time do I have? I'm good? Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks very much, guys.